This week we have Gerard Higgins here uh, from the Institute of Quantum Optics and Quantum Information from Vienna, uh, and he'll give us a seminar. Um, he's uh, spent some time trapping Rydberg ions as a new platform for quantum information processing, uh, spending time in Innsbruck in Austria, and then also uh, in Stockholm, Sweden, as I understand. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll let him take it away. So whenever you're ready. So hello everybody. Um, so I work in, I'm involved in experiments both in Vienna and in Gothenburg, that's in Sweden. And in these experiments, we levitate superconductors. And um, with everything, that's a little bit annoying with the screen. Oh, no. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay, that's perfect. Sorry. So, I work in Vienna and also a little bit in Sweden, in Gothenburg. And in these experiments, we levitate superconducting particles. So, this is a representation of the experiment. We've got a magnetic field and we've got this levitated particle, and the particle can oscillate by the drop center. So, it behaves as a mechanical oscillator. And we're developing these systems as mechanical oscillators for doing tests of quantum physics and also for building really good sensors and for searching for dark matter. So, so, so yeah, that's um, what I'm describing here. So, there's lots of different tests that we can think about doing with when we've got a heavy object in a quantum state. We can test if there's some. Um, difference between the classical world and the quantum world if there's uh, some additional wave function collapse that appears. Another um, very exciting or very interesting potential is to be probing the interface between quantum physics and general relativity. So there's ideas that we'd be able to see effects appear in our experiments. And for mechanical sensing, there's different things to do, such as searching for dark matter, which um, you guys here in Yale are very familiar with. So I'll explain these two um, motivations a little bit further. So firstly, the one regarding gaining some insight into quantum gravity, right? So first of all, if we talk about having two charges, if we've got a positive charge and a negative charge, they're going to attract each other and there's going to be an electrostatic in interaction. And then if we consider putting this positive charge in a superposition of locations, then there's going to be a superposition of, of two different um, poles that are experienced by the, the negative charge. So there's going to be both a stronger pull and a weaker pull, depending on the separation. Then if we let the system evolve for some time, then the negative charge is going to be accelerating fast and it's going to be accelerating slow. So it's going to evolve into two different locations. It's going to evolve into a superposition. And this superposition state is going to then be correlated with the superposition state of the blue charge. So the system would evolve into some correlated superposition state because there is a superposition of two different electrostatic flows. And, and we can witness this in the laboratory. We can see that if we can do this, then we see that there's a correlated superposition state emerge. And in other words, that's an entangled state emerges in such a system. And that tells us that um, witnessing this tells us that the electromagnetic field can be in a superposition state that is described by quantum physics. Then, if we imagine doing this experiment with two masses instead, we can have the blue mass, the orange mass, and now there's a gravitational pull between them. If we put the blue mass into a superposition of locations, we might expect there to then be a superposition of two different gravitational pulls acting on the orange mass, and the system might evolve into an entangled state. That would be something that would be very nice to do in the lab, but it's very, very challenging because gravity is a very, very weak interaction. So we need to have sizable masses before we can see any gravitational effects and before we can experience any sizable pull. And, and so this hasn't been done experimentally yet, but it's something that um, there's ideas about doing if we really push our control of sizable masses um, so, so we can put them in quantum superposition states. And then if we were able to witness um, an entangled state arising or not, that would really tell us 
how quantum in theory, theory whether or not quantum theory can describe gravitational physics. And there would be some interesting implications of this because we know that we can understand uh, gravity as, a, as being equivalent to space-time curvature according to general relativity. So if the gravitational interaction can be in a superposition state, that would mean that the, the space-time curvature itself can be in a superposition of two different states, which is, um, I think, quite a fun implication. So that's the motivation for really pushing towards having quantum control of these systems for doing fundamental physics. At the same time, we can um, we can use these systems as really good sensors. So, and one of the applications <clears throat> is to look for dark matter. Most of the matter in our universe seems to be dark matter, um, but we don't know much about it. Uh, we don't know if its mass is really, really small at the 10 to the minus 22 electron volts level or something really, really big up to hundreds of solar masses. If we talk to some theorists, they can point us towards some different well-motivated candidates. And um, so the search across this giant mass range is um, not maybe so intimidating once we've got some candidates to really focus on to. Well-motivated candidates um, typically are the ones that involve making small extensions to the standard model, or else um, candid candidates that really would at the same time explain other problems that we've got in physics. So for instance, some candidates might explain why we've Got neutrino oscillations up here. And so we can try searching for this in different dark matter candidates <clears throat> using mechanical sensors. For instance, ultra light dark matter would behave as a wave, which would cause an oscillate, which would have a resonance frequency and it would cause an oscillating force on a mechanical set sensor causing an oscillatory motion. As well, mechanical sensors would be sensitive to ultra heavy dark matter. And that would be dark matter, which would behave as big clumps, big particles, which would occasionally pass by and cause an impulse to be experienced by the mechanical sensor. So these are the different kinds of candidates that we can consider looking for. And then um, we can think about using many, many different types of mechanical sensors for doing this. So, so in the last decades, people have achieved really great experimental control over a whole range of different kinds of mechanical oscillators, from the zeptogram level to the femtogram level, from femtograms up to grams, all the way up to the kilogram um, size mirrors that are hanging in LIGO. And in all of these um, systems that I'm describing here or representing here, the researchers are able to read out the motion of these mechanical oscillators um, typically towards the standard quantum limit. And they're, they always put in a lot of effort into isolating the mechanical motion really well from the surroundings. So these are like the two real features that you want to have in these mechanical oscillators if you want to be doing quantum tests or if you want to be making a really good sensor. And, <clears throat> and then in these systems, um, the ones who are represented here involve measurements um, using light. So shining a laser onto it, measuring the reflected light, often as part of an interferometer um, to measure the motion more precisely. And that, but then there's other ways to measure the motion as well, which we'll come to. And then whenever it comes to isolating the systems from the surroundings, people, it depends on the different system, but um, people put in a lot of effort into making sure that it's in a cold environment and vacuum and so on. So in all of these systems that I'm representing, it, they involve things like a rod, which is clamped to the outside world, or a membrane, which is connected to the outside world, or a mass hanging from a spring. And always then there's some mechanical connection to the outside world. And then this mechanical in, um, connection, at the end of the day, it can be the, whatever is limiting um, the connect, how well the system can be isolated from the surroundings. So who really want to have a system that's very, very well isolated, it seems like a reasonable approach for us to remove any clamp, to remove any mechanical uh, connection. And that's what brings us to having levitated mechanical oscillators. So we can consider optically levitating particles and measuring um, their motion, their, or electrically levitating particles or magnetically levitating them. In David Merce group here, um, optical levitation is used. 
in Jack Harris's group, magnetic levitation is used for the mechanical oscillators. Um, and yeah, so I work with the magnetic levitation, which I'll come to, right? But so in recent years, the difference, there's been lots and lots of groups working with optically levitated systems, and they've been able to achieve tremendous control over these, um, the motion of these particles. So for instance, people have been levitating nanospheres and measuring out the motion of these nanospheres really, really well, and applying feedback on the system so that the motion can be cooled down all the way down to the um, quantum mechanical ground state. So that's a tremendous speed, which is like the gateway before you start to be doing, to be doing quantum experiments with these systems. But from a long-term perspective, there's some um, disadvantages of optical levitation. There's always going to be um, a powerful trapping laser that's needed, and there's always going to be some unwanted absorption of this laser light, and always some unwanted scattering of this laser light as well. And then this is going to cause additional little kicks on the particle, which limits how well it's isolated from the surroundings. A different approach is to work with charged particles, which can be trapped in electric fields, for instance, in a pole trap. And recently there was um, some really nice work there where the motion of these particles was had a dissipation rate as well as like 100 nanohertz, as in the group of Tracy Martha. And, but in the long term, maybe this approach might be limited by the particles being charged, electrically charged, and then they're very sensitive to electric fields from the surroundings. And as well, this involves an oscillating um, electric field, which is for trapping, which is very hard to stabilize, very, very well. And then the last approach here is to use magnetic levitation. <clears throat> and we can consider levitating ferromagnets. Um, but ferroma in ferromagnets, the magnetization drips a little bit in time, and this is a dissipation mechanism. Um, another problem with this approach is that ferromagnets are often conducting. So then if you've got a conductor, if you've got a magnet that's moving, this is going to drive a current instead of a conductor. And then this can lead to additional dissipation because there can be resistive losses. So we, so this is a disadvantage of levitating ferromagnets. Instead, you can think about levitating diamagnets. These are objects which oppose any applied magnetic fields. So this is what's done, for instance, in Jack Harris's group as well, and the approach that we follow in Vienna. So we levitate diamagnetic particles. Um, in particular, we levitate superconductors. So that's what I'll be describing in the next part of, um, of my talk. So superconductors, <clears throat> If you apply a magnetic field to the to a superconductor, a uh, current flows on the surface of the superconductor, which opposes any applied magnetic field. And so then no magnetic field can enter a superconductor. So in this way, it can behave as an ideal diamagnet. It really expels any magnetic field that's applied to it. And so then diamagnets, um, they can be trapped where there's a magnetic field minimum. So this is what our trap looks like. We've got two coils that produces a magnetic quadrupole field with a minimum in the center, and that's where we can stably trap our particle. And you see here that the magnetic field lines of the trap, they end up bending around the particle. <clears throat> so the particles that we've been working with um, are normally about 100 micrometers across, weighing about six micrograms. Then to give you a better idea of what the system actually looks like, um, this is a picture of one of the coils that we use for trapping. It's a few centimeters across. It's got many, many, many windings. Then in the very center, we've got a little plastic bowl that we 3D print. So we can come along, whenever the system's all open, we can come along and pick up a particle with a needle, set it inside of our bowl, and take the other coil and put it on top. We put the whole thing in a box. We put the box inside of our cryostat, and then we cool everything down. And then once it's all cold and the particle is superconducting, then when we apply a current into the coil, that makes our trap, and then the particle can stably be confined in the middle of the trap. So that's how the levitation works. And so as well as this experiment in Vienna, I also work in an experiment in Gothenburg in Sweden, and it follows more or less the same approach. We've got two coils that produces a magnetic trap, 
but here the coils are written onto chips. So there's one coil on one chip and another coil written on another chip. This is um, a top view and scanning electron micrograph where you can see the individual windings of this trap. It's just a, about a millimeter across, so it's miniaturized. And then we stack these chips on top of each other and we can levitate a particle then in the hole between the chips. So there's advantages of the miniaturized approach. If we want to make um, an array of sensors, it's good that we can have a really densely packed array because we've got all these small traps. As well, having the miniaturized setup means that we can have more exact position and stronger magnetic field gradients in the system so that we can get stiffer traps. And the chip-based approach allows more elements to be integrated so that we can really position the elements very well with respect to one another. By the way, please interrupt me as I'm going along if there's anything not clear or any questions or anything. So in the method you described to levitate it, so the sphere is just sitting on the base and then when you cool it down, it just lifts off the base and gets sucked into the minimum. So we cool it down and it doesn't lift off until we apply the magnetic field. So we, we have the system, it's, we have the magnetic truck turned off so that we can cool, cool down the particle in an environment with not any strong magnetic field. And then once it's all cold and everything's superconducting, the particle's superconducting, also the coils, the windings um, are superconducting as well. Then we can apply current into these superconducting coils and the particle will block. So then when we've got our particle that's levitated, we want to be able to measure its motion as well as possible. And to measure the motion, and um, we don't need any optics or anything, we can measure it use, um, by the magnetic field disturbance that it causes as it moves around. So as we saw earlier, the magnetic field lines of the track, they bend around the particle because the particle expels the magnetic field. And so as the particle moves inside of the trap, it, it causes this field distortion to change. And we place a little loop close to the particle. And so as the particle oscillates about the trap center, the magnetic flux that's going through this loop oscillates. And that causes an oscillating current to go around the loop, and we measure this oscillating current using a magnetometer, or using a very good current sensor. And that's a squid or a superconducting quantum interference device. So the squid, it really just measures this current and it spits out a voltage. And if we measure this for some time, and then we take the Fourier transform or look at the power spectrum, we can see some peaks appear in the spectrum. And we see peaks at about 40 hertz, 70 hertz, 120 hertz, and these correspond to the um, trapping frequencies that, that the particle has. And, we, and we're confident about this because we can change the current that we're supplying to the coils. This changes the trap stiffness, and we see that the trapping frequencies, the peaks in the spectrum, respond linearly. And also, we can understand these frequencies by finite element modeling of our system as well. So we can trap our particle, we can measure it. And then the next ingredient that we want is a system that's really well isolated from its surroundings. <clears throat> and to measure how well it's isolated, <clears throat> sorry, um, we can do a ring down measurement. And it's got that like, it, it's much the same as if you take a bell and you hit the bell and you listen and over time the ringing sound from the bell will take case. So when we turn on our trap, the particle initially has a very large motional amplitude. And over time, the motional, the motional energy dissipates. And it follows an exponential decay and that's shown here. Um, on a, the y-axis is a log scale. And it takes several hours for the motion to decay. So the dissipation rates below 10 microhertz and the motion has a quality factor higher than 10 million. So that's already quite good. Um, but we see some interesting feature here that initially the, the dissipation is slow, then it can proceed more quickly and go slow again. And we, we understand that is arising from magnetic flux that can be trapped inside of the particle. That's causing additional dissipation, which is a little bit irregular. So let me explain this trapped flux effect a little bit. So 
I was telling you that superconductors, they pose an applied magnetic field and the magnetic field lines have to bend around the superconductors. That's, that's the ideal case. But really, um, superconductors can trap a little bit of magnetic flux inside of them and forming these vortices inside. And this trapped flux can also wander around in time. So we, our particle can have magnetic flux trapped inside, which wanders around and um, occasionally becomes pinned on crystalline defects. And then it doesn't cause so much dissipation, but from time to time, it becomes unpinned and wanders around a bit more. And that's why that sometimes our anticipation rate increases. So this is something that we want to avoid in our systems. We, we don't want to have any of this trap flux so that our dissipation rate can be even lower than what we've got here. And yes. So I'm wondering what level of vacuum are you at when measuring this key value? So, um, so the vacuum is probably a lot less than 10 to the 6 millibars. Um, so there's a room temperature part of our vacuum pan that measures 10 to minus 6 millibars, but then the cold part of the cryo is probably a lot less. Right. Yeah. But even if it was a 10 to minus 6, it shouldn't be limiting the, the dissipation right now. Okay, so your dissipation, you're confident it's not from air molecule. No, like this here. Yeah. Air molecules at the level of 10 to minus 6 millibars shouldn't be causing such a dissipation. And you don't need any feedback to keep the particle there. No, no, it's it's just that. <laughs> Actually, we do need some vibration isolation because we've got these very low frequencies of the trap. And if there was a lot of vibration or noise, there's a lot of vibration or noise at these low frequencies, especially inside of a cryostat. And but like even so the particle can be kicked around a lot, but I think it's there's very low risk of losing the particle in this way. So let's see. So right, we want to get rid of any magnetic flux that's trapped inside of the particle. And there's then two approaches that we're following to do this. We um, can use magnetic shielding to make sure that the particle is in an environment with no magnetic field as it's being cooled below its critical superconducting temperature. That's one approach. Um, that we're going to do. And then another approach is to be more careful about the type of superconducting conductor that we're working with. So we've been working with lead tin in book spheres, and that's because they're commercially available. You can order this online, but you, that's because lead tin is used to solder. And, and it's in, they come in nice spherical shapes. But lead tin is, is a so-called type two superconductor. A type two superconductor is a superconductor that allows magnetic flux to be trapped. But there's other materials that are better at expelling the magnetic flux. And these are called type one superconducting materials. And that includes pure lead, for instance. So we've been making microspheres of pure lead, um, which should perform better in our system because they shouldn't be trapping as much flux. To produce this, we've been using ultrasonic cavitation. So this involves taking um, a piece of lead, setting it into a bath, heating the whole system up so that the lead melts, and then applying ultrasound to the system. And the ultrasound causes cavities to form, and inside of these cavities, then some really nice spherical balls can appear of pure lead. So this is something that um, we need to levitate and then see, okay, how well do these particles perform? And, and really to have like ideal particles that really expel the magnetic flux as well as possible, we should be also using crisp, like in single crystals. And because the magnetic flux, even in a type one material can still enter on crystalline defects. And so we've thermally annealed these particles, and then we see that crystalline um, that they that they look like we see crystalline facets appearing on on the particles, and that's a good sign. So this is something that we expect will get much better dissipation rates um, soon. And then, as well as as well as focusing on like avoiding flux, this system does involve. Um, we, do, we already take quite a lot of 
occur to avoid having the particle coupled to the surroundings. So, so we need to have the particle hanging from a vibration isolation platform so that um, external vibrations mostly caused by the cryostat because the cryostat makes these noises like of moving parts that causes the whole system to shift. So we've got the particle levitated in a trap inside of a box which hangs from some springs, which hang from more springs, which hang from the four Kelvin stage of cryostat. And with this spring system, we're able to attenuate the vertical vibrations by about 10 to the 5 at 200 hertz. That's the a typical motion of frequency that we, that we work with. Um, as well, this system, it behaves as a triple pendulum. So it also isolates the system from horizontal vibrations at an even higher level. So we isolate the system from vibrations. As well, we isolate it from magnetic field noise by storing the whole system in a superconducting box. So a superconductor, um, so we've got these boxes made of aluminium that we use for surrounding the system. And then superconductors don't allow um, magnetic field noise to enter the system. So, so that's very important because magnetic field noise would drive motion of our particle. Yeah. And these superconducting boxes, um, I was describing earlier that, okay, to get rid of the charge flux, we would want to be using a magnetic shield that can get rid of DC fields so that the particle can be cooled in low magnetic field environment. Unfortunately, the superconducting box can't do that. It's only good against AC fields. So we're going to have to like upgrade this to have uh, multiple types of shielding. Where did you get the vibration isolation system? We made it. With the frame attached to the plates. Yeah. So so we've got springs, and then um, these plates are actually 3D printed pieces. Um, it's nice because right, we need to have the system at a cold temperature. So this box is thermally connected to the cool part of the cryostat. And we don't want the system to be well thermally connected to the four Kelvin stage. So that's why it's nice to have like thermal insulators at these parts. So plastic is a nice insulator. And then these springs are actually just very thin uh, steel wire pieces. So it's about 30 microns across or so. And steel wire, whenever it's so thin, it's already quite springy. So with this, we've got like resonance frequencies of about 10 hertz or so in for each of these stages. And then the system behaves like a low pass filter at the higher frequencies. But yeah, there's other groups who actually work with actual springs and um, which I think it's I guess a nice approach as well because okay there's advantages and disadvantages bigger springs means a better thermal connection up to there but it's also kind of easier to work with because our very thin wires they break and then the whole system is it's tricky to set this up so we can levitate the particles, we can read out the motion, and we have the that well isolated from the surroundings. Then if we want to start going towards having quantum control over the system, the kind of first step that people aim for is to cool the motion of the particle to its quantum mechanical ground state. And so we can, the way that we, so we can already apply feedback cooling in our system, we can't go all the way to the ground state, but let me explain how the feedback cooling works. So we measure the particle using this pickup loop and using the squid. The squid gives us a voltage, which we feed to some control electronics. The control electronics then um, sends an oscillating current into an additional coil that we have in the system, a little coil. And this oscillating current then causes an oscillating magnetic field, which opposes the motion of the particle. So with this, we can um, we can oppose the motion of the particle to cool its to reduce its motional amplitude over a time scale of seconds rather than a time scale of hours, as we saw in the ring down measurement earlier. And then the, the question is how well can we reduce the motional amplitude? And we can reduce its motional amplitude down to the level where its equivalent temperature is about 200 millikelvin, 
it sounds like a very low temperature, but actually for us that corresponds to about 10 to the 7 phonons or 10 to the 7 motion of quantum. And that's because we've got these very low trapping frequencies in this quite large mass. So, so, <clears throat> so what we want to do in our system is to get this all the way down to below one to really get to the quantum mechanical ground state. And, and the limitation right now is as to how far we can cool it really comes from how well we can measure the motion of the particle. So, so let's say that we could only resolve motion, a motion amplitude this much. If the particle starts with motion amplitude this much, we can cool it down so that it gets to this level, but we can't keep on cooling it further because of the imprecision in our measurement. So to cool further, we need to improve um, mostly how well we measure the particle. So, so we've got a clear path that we um, of improvements that we're going to make to cool it down to the ground state. We can increase the signal that we get by taking more care in positioning of the pickup that I was describing that's close to the particle, in, in the position of this pickup, and also in its geometry and how many windings it has, for instance. We also can improve by quite a lot how well we transfer magnetic flux from this pickup into the squid. So that's how we improve the signal. We can decrease the noise in our system, especially the noise the squid experiences by improving the amount of magnetic shielding we have. We also can improve how well the particle is isolated from the surroundings. That's going to help us as well. We can improve the vibration isolation and improve the quality factor. The main approaches there is to focus on type one superconducting materials and to improve the magnetic shielding. So, so we've got a clear path to the ground set, but in parallel to that, we're exploring some other avenues to get there. So I was describing measuring the motion of the particle using this pickup and, and the squid, and then just measuring the voltage from the squid. But there's a different trick that we can play and that we've been using recently. It's that we can have the squid in, embedded in an LC resonator. And the squid would then affect, depending on how the particle moves, then via the squid, the resonance frequency of the resonator is going to change. And then we can probe the particle motion via this resonator. So, so right, we've got the particle, as it moves, it changes the flux in this pickup coil. It changes the current inside of this loop. It changes the flux in this other coil, which then it is inducted to coupled into the squid. So as the particle moves, the flux inside of the squid changes. And the squid has an inductance, which depends upon this flux. So the inductance of the squid um, changes then depending on the particle um, position. And, and because this is part of an LC resonator, then the, the resonance frequency of this LC resonator depends on the squid inductance as well. And that's at a microwave frequency. So then by probing this system with in, with microwave radiation, we're able to learn about the position of the particle. And this, it's, it's a nice approach because we've converted our signal from a low frequency signal at like 100 hertz, all the way up to microwave frequencies where there's typically less noise. Another advantage of this approach is that this is um, a kind of superconducting circuit that can be tweaked a bit to become a, super, a superconducting qubit. And then instead of only measuring the motion of the particle using the superconducting circuit, we can use the coupling between them to go in the other direction to introduce quantum noise into the motion of the particle so, so that we can actually get interesting quantum states of the particle motion. And then a different avenue that we're exploring as well is to measure the particle motion optically. So the particle is um, it's made of metal, it's shiny, and, and so if we, if we shine light on the particle, the light gets reflected, just like a mirror. And so the particle behaves as one of the mirrors of a Michelson interferometer. And, and this allows us to measure the motion interferometrically. But to get all the way down to the ground stage with this approach, we need to use quite a lot more light. And then this would heat up the particle and cause it to not be superconducting anymore. Um, so we're going to tweak this setup a bit so that instead of reflecting light off a superconductor, we're going to add a mirror onto the system, like a dielectric mirror that we can reflect light without heating up, without unwanted absorption. OK, 
Okay, so I've been describing then the work that I've been doing for the last three years, um, where we're working with these micro particles, but really we're aiming to control the motion of the particle and put it into a quantum state for probing quantum physics. But like the same features of the system that we can measure very precisely with superconducting circuits and that it can be really well isolated from the surroundings, this also makes it a really good system for sensing. And this is an avenue that I'm really um, starting to pursue now. So you know, the system has the potential of making a really, really excellent acceleration sensor. So in this graph, we see um, a comparison of some of the leading accelerometers that are out there. Um, here in sensitivity, that's describing the imprecision of the sensor, so lower numbers are better. And the different masses of the sensors are compared, and we see that larger masses tend to make for better accelerometers. So right now, the um, system in Vienna, we've got a very respectable acceleration sensitivity over here, especially for sensor around about the microgram scale. And then I'm planning on scaling up the system to about the ground level um, and getting a better acceleration sensitivity. And it's also worth noting as well that there's other kinds of levitated superconducting sensors out there. So there's um, a commercial device which is used to measure Earth's gravity. So there's a network of these commercial sensors around the world. They all involve the levitated superconductor, and they're some of the best in most measuring changes of Earth's gravity over time. And there's also a system in Maryland where they um, use levitated superconductors to measure gravity gradients very, very well. I think there's a question there. There's a question. Let's see. So the question is, do the particles not rotate because they're not perfectly spherical? Yes, they will rotate. Um, so if they were perfectly spherical, they'll still rotate, but then that won't really disturb us so much. If they're non-spherical, they can rotate, and this is going to cause an additional field disturbance at causing an additional peak in our spectrum. Um, and then the question is, like, does it really disturb us so much? Let's make a bit of this. So, so we actually see effects, right, with, the, with these commercial um, spheres that we buy, they're spherical enough that we haven't seen any rotational effects with them. But we can also levitate two particles. So when we levitate two particles, they both get attracted to the truck center, and then they behave like a dumbbell, as represented, as this is a picture of two particles levitated at our trap. So we've got optical access, we can shine light through. And this is like the silhouette that's made by the two levitated particles. So the two particles, they, they have the translational motion in X, Y, and Z, but they also can have a kind of trapped rotational motion, a vibrational motion. And yeah, we can measure this. And one of them, and there's advantages of this vibrational motion when it, come, when it comes to sensing. Um, because vibrations and rotations, they're insensitive to translational noise, like vibrations. And that's why, for instance, in the Cavendish experiment, like 200 years ago or whatever, uh, Cavendish was using a torsional pendulum for measuring the very small force caused by gravity. So, so, that's, so there's advantages to be um, explored when it comes to using rotors more than any problems that appear. I think that was the question, right? But, okay, so, so I was describing what are the plans for making really good sensors, in particular for looking for dark matter. So um, I want to be working with higher masses towards the gram scale or so. If we go much larger than a gram, then we'd have to change the trapping geometry quite a bit before it would work. So at least um, for now, we'll stick to the ground scale. As well, I want to explore different particle shapes. So 
having vultures or dumbbells is nice because it's insensitive to these external vibrations. And um, it allows us to access lower resonance frequencies because these uh, rotational motion, if you've got a more or less cylindrically spherical trap, you can have almost free rotation, which then is really good for sensing because it makes a very compliant sensor or a very compliant oscillator. So, so we want to use rotors to measure torques or to cause measure like differential forces acting on the two dumbbells. I also want to use hollow shells because this seems to be a really good approach for magnetic fields and sensing. So if we have an, a magnetic field affecting our system, it causes the trap center to shift and that, that drives motion of the particle. And it turns out that having a low density particle is a good approach for this. So and working with hollow shells instead of dense shells seems to be a good, good way to go. And as well for sensing, um, this platform's got a very good potential for having miniaturized setups to make a, a density effect array. And yes, and that means more sensors, but also it means that it can be easier. Like if you've got a density packed array, it should be possible to do common mode rejection or common noise rejection and to a higher extent. And then I'll describe what dark matter candidates in this system is particularly good for probing. So one of them is an ultralight dark matter candidate called B minus vector B minus L dark matter. Um, this dark matter behaves as a wave, which causes an oscillating acceleration or, or an oscillating force to be acting on everything. But the amplitude of the force depends upon the material position. So different materials will experience different um, force depending on the ratio of the protons and the neutron or neutrons inside of them. So the idea is then to work with a dumbbell with one ball made of one material, another ball made of a different material. And then the differential acceleration experienced by the two balls is going to drive oscillatory rotations of this dumbbell. So the idea is to really be probing low frequencies. Um, so right, the, the, the oscillation frequency caused by this dark matter and depends upon the dark matter mass, which is related to the dark matter Compton frequency. So really the the oscillation appears at the dark matter Compton frequency. So this would cause then an additional peak in the spectrum that we saw earlier. I'm trying to understand why you are having such a broadband um, sensitivity because you're using like one mode, right? And I, I suppose um, the dip here is your resonant frequency <laughs> in this block. Yeah. So if you've got a high frequency, like yeah, typically sensors operate best on on resonance, and then and then they've always felt like let me see. Okay, they always the susceptibility always is this kind of form where it's like flat, it goes down, it goes up again, just like here. This flat region, and if you've got a higher frequency resonator, this flat region is higher up. So it's advantageous if you want to have a nice broad low frequency sensitivity. It's going to be working with uh, with a lower frequency resonator. This just follows from the mechanical. This is like really what the mechanical susceptibility looks like, right? So does the, the curve like curves up in even lower frequency? And for the for the for the mechanical susceptibility, no. For this curve. Yes, uh, because it's flat. I see. Yeah, for the like the mechanical susceptibility of the mechanical center, it's it's flat all the way to zero in principle. And then this curve for like how well we can sense, like there's a big question mark on a lot of this. Like the title of the talk is towards right, but towards making these sensors, it's not. Yeah. And like getting rid of low frequency noise is going to be difficult, and and that's why. It's important, I think, to use these torsional and um, to measure torsional motion, which is insensitive to low frequency noise from trams and from every from gravity noise in the earth. And yeah, so at some point we won't be able to go down much. This is going to go up again, but it's unclear if it's going to happen at this level, this level, this level. 
we'll see. So if I understand correctly, your like flat um, is set basically by your imprecision, it's in an ideal way. Yeah. So yeah, the imprecision noise, I mean, yeah, the back action noise is flat. The imprecision noise at the low frequencies is flat, ideally. Um, except like there's always going to be voltage fluctuations on your sensor, for instance, and that's going to cause imprecision noise in the end system to go up low frequencies. So squids display low frequency noise. So if so on a squid, it's normal that we have um, the imprecision noise going up at the low frequencies. But I want to get around that by, by using additional elements in the circuit to do a kind of frequency of conversion to, to, so that the low frequency noise of the squid can be avoided by really kind of converting the squid, the signal to a higher frequency. So, and this is like a problem that's and the people working with Weber bars or, and the descendants of Weber bars for gravitational wave searches, they also involve work with like mechanical objects that they're measuring using squids and at low frequencies. And then there's like things we learn from them about converting signals from low frequencies. So, so I mean, just I was very curious, how do they actually, how low reduction can you expect by just reducing this? Uh, the frequency noise, just how, so is there like one or F noise that may yeah, that's so, haunted the system? So yeah, if there was no up conversion, there is one of our F noise, which is gonna cause this to go up. And this graph doesn't include the one of our F noise because I need mean, to, to get rid of it entirely. Yeah, exactly. But then like, at some point, there's always going to be um, drifts of the temperature, driving changes of, voltages, small voltages, it's always going to cause anything that we do to get um, to some one of our F noise at some point. I see. So this is the vector view and SL dark matter. As well, the system can be used to look for dark photons and axion light particles. So so the idea with these searches is to have the particle acting as a magnetometer inside of a superconducting box. So the dark photons or the axion light particles will come along and drive an oscillating current on the conducting box, which then causes an oscillating magnetic field inside of the box. And this oscillating magnetic field then drives oscillatory motion of the particle, which can be measured. And then, um, then the idea is to probe the regimes marked by these orange lines here. Um, now we're talking about higher frequencies. So this is actually considered using a resonance sensor. So this is like the sensitivity that we get working at one frequency. And then we'd change the frequency of our system and repeat the experiment, and then to be able to probe a larger range. So this is involving scanning the this line, the projection here involves measuring for a year different resonance frequencies. And then in this graph, in the dark gray areas here and also here are representing existing experimental bounds. And the light gray regions are representing astrophysical bounds and cosmological bounds. So, so the idea would be to exceed on the existing experimental bounds. And it's very hard to beat the astrophysical bounds, though it's, it's so valuable to do these kinds of experiments because a lot of astrophysical bounds rely upon you know, quite a lot of modeling of whatever's going on up in space. And so it's nice to have things done here on Earth. And then a final um, thing I'd like to describe is the potential for looking for ultra heavy dark matter. So. The mechanical, the mechanical sensor, if, if a heavy particle goes by, it can cause an impulse and that can also be sensed. So now we're talking about dark matter particles or at the microgram level of mass. And 
um, and such a search would be a broadband search or so model independent search. So it would be just kind of looking for a general interaction um, that can be described in terms of a coupling strength per nucleus of our sensor. And as far as I know, the existing bound in this uh, regime comes from the xenon one ton experiment. Um, it's not exactly what xenon one ton was designed to do, but um, they can extend their sensitivity up to here. And then with this, with let's see, this um, superconductors within in the reasonable near term, and hope to be able to probe this parameter regime represented here. And then in the long term, there's quite an interesting prospect represented by this arrow here, where we could uh, get down to this red line. And if we get down there, we'd be sensitive enough to measure a gravitational interaction. As the, between the dark matter and the ordinary master sensor as the dark matter particle flies by. And that's um, a really inter interesting thing to do because like all of the evidence we have for dark matter is that it interacts with ordinary matter via gravity. We don't have any evidence for it interacting via some new interaction, via some fifth force or anything. And so unlike the existing searches for dark matter, this would really be proving in a completely model independent way and be able to really, um, if we were able to probe in this mass regime, this would allow us to really conclusively probe this mass regime. Um, that's the idea. So this idea is described in this paper from Dan Carney and co-authors, and they describe having a large array of mechanical sensors. So having, I think like a hundred or a thousand by a hundred or a thousand, hundred or a thousand, so a, big, a big array. And then as the dark particle, dark matter particle flies through, it'll cause an impulse on any sensor that's close by. And the sensors further away won't receive an, any sizable impulse. And so then there'd be like a track of impulses left inside of this array. And that's something that um, could be searched for. So there's a collaboration called the Winchan collaboration of people who are interested in, 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 in this goal. So we meet on Zoom and uh, discuss different challenges and different ideas. And there's quite a big mix of theorists and phenomenologists and experimentalists in this collaboration. It's quite fun. And then there's some other things that we can think about doing as well, as well as looking for dark matter with these systems. We can also think about looking for, um, for testing the neutrality of matter, just like um, you guys have done in David Moore's group, and also if you're interested in doing in Jack Harris's group, and searching for milli charge particles as well. So actually, these levitated superconductors in the past, they were being used to search for quarks. To look. There was an idea that maybe quarks can just exist by themselves. And so this was one of the main platforms that people were using, um, I don't know, 40 years ago, by this approach. And actually, the papers say that they found quarks, but um, it was never retracted or any. So maybe they did. No. Um, then it's also a good system for testing uh, collapse models in quantum physics. And, and there's also really cool potential that in Night Impact Society at large, it's to improve upon existing earthquake early warning systems. So, so not only whenever, whenever an earthquake happens, there's Two waves leave the epicenter. There's fast one and slower one. The fast one and doesn't cause any damage, but it's picked up by the earthquake sensors or earthquake early warning systems. And then the slower one arrives and knocks down buildings and all. So in the warning time between the two waves, people can evacuate buildings, get under tables. But there's a, in addition to these two waves, there's a wave that moves at the speed of light called an, an elastogravity wave. And in sometime in the next decades, uh, mechanical sensors should be reaching the point of having strain sensitivities that are good enough to be measuring these waves. And it would like effectively double the warning time offered by earthquake early warning systems. So I think that's a really fun um, potential application. So I work with these people in, in Chalmers, the group set by the FBX track. And in Vienna, the, the, select, the teams are led by Marcus Aspermeyer and Michael Trucker. So thank you for your attention.
question. I have a question still about the um, B minus L H boson. So um, you're basically sensing a differential acceleration and you supposed to using two different materials. And I'm just still confused. How do you, from the experimental point of view, how do you sense the relative acceleration of two levitated particles? So if we've got a dumbbell with two different materials, right? And this one's going to, I mean, they're both going to experience force in this direction, let's say, and also doing force along this direction. But there's going to be a difference. In, Let's talk about the difference between the forces. So effectively, this one's going to experience a force in this direction. Okay. And this one's going to experience a force in that direction. So it's going to drive like. Oh, so you have, you have started thinking about the dumbbell. I see. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so with the dumbbell, it's nice. It kind of naturally means that you've got a torque arise. But what if dark matter is not aligned with whatever your dumbbell is aligned? Yeah, then that's unfortunate. But. <laughs> <laughs> And one thing is like the earth spins. So over the course of the day, hopefully we'll be sensitive. And it also means that like, that's also a kind of interesting, interesting signature of, or a nice feature of mechanical sensors that they have the direction of sensitivity. Right. So then there should be a modulation of the course of the day in, in any signal. So instead of just seeing a peak, we should see like a two peaks split by, and, one divided by a day <laughs> frequency. But yeah, if you've got two particles that are not connected by a stick, then you also display like relative um, a difference. I, I mean, they both respond to the you know, B minus cell dark matter, but they are different amplitudes. On the screen that is covered the Designator, it's forming the LC designator. Have you guys already done that? Yes. And what is the improvement in sensitivity? And it is not at the level where it's any improvement yet, but we've got it to work. So let's see. So actually, there'll be a manuscript on the archive, hopefully in the next month, um, with this title, and and it's like, in some ways, it's a it's the first demonstration of like doing remote sensing with this kind of a system. So we've got a flux transformer in the system that kind of, right, this flux transformer, okay. In principle, we could put a squid right next to the particle and measure how the particle motion starts the magnetic field and measure that directly with the squid or with squid resonator circuit. And, but there's the disadvantage that this circuit's quite sensitive to strong magnetic fields. And that's why we need to use this flux transformer circuit to really move the flux from here all the way into the squid in this low magnetic field environment. So, so this uh, work that we've done is like the first demonstration of using like remote sensing of something with such a circuit. Because people have used these um, circuits in other systems. When you mentioned about the sensitive curves, and uh, you talk about this dark matter and then jump to ultra high dark matter, heavy dark matter, sorry. Yes. Uh, how much have to change that duration of the experiment in order to go to that another energy scale? And then you show uh, uh, that you will put a lot of these kind of detectors, but. Yeah. So the idea is to like work with only two different configurations. One configuration, is to use a levitated dumbbell. And the levitated dumbbell would be sensitive to accelerations and to impulses. So right, for the B minus L, um, the different materials will experience an um, oscillating torque. And at the end of the day, the dumbbell is going to experience an oscillating torque. But at the same time, this is going to be a system sensitive to impulses because let's say we've got this dumbbell, a dark matter particle flies fast. The impact parameter experienced by the two different balls of the dumbbell is going to be different. And then this is going to cause like a rotational impulse on the system. Right? So, so the same system that would be sensitive to B minus L would be sensitive at the same time to ultra heavy dark matter. We just be measuring the two things at the same time. So that for ultra heavy dark matter, you need that scale a lot of the 
Oh, fine, fine, fine. Um, yeah, so this curve here, I think it's considering just one or, or maybe three sensors instead of a big array. If we want to get to this level, we have to like play all the tricks we can. We have to do um, squeezing, and we have to do back action evasion. We need really good isolation from the surroundings. We need a big array. We need a lot of money. So, um, but at least to get to this level, this was a sensitivity with three sensors measuring for like two months or something. With the same configuration that would be probing the VMAX app. So, so there's two configurations that I'm really talking about, the dumbbell configuration and the magnetometer configuration. So the magnetometer one, that's the, the one with the dark photons and the axion-like particles. And that's to make a good magnetometer, it seems to be good to work with hollow spheres rather than dumbbells. But it, this is something that I'm still um, working with the phenomenologists on. Yeah, follow-up question. Do you know where Dave's curve was drawn on, on that curve, like on that plot for having dark matter? Um, do you know what Max? Like, I thought you guys were. I haven't. You we're guys were in order to see a lot. Yeah, like it's been around ten to minus seven, but. Um, for mass in kilogram, that is just minus seven grams, or no, I, I just I just can't convert the um, natural units in my mind. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to know. And that's okay. So. It looks like the the reason that I'm talking about this mass range is because of like this long term potential. I think is like fun, even though it's like a ridiculous number of orders of magnitude away. Yeah. I think there are a number of questions that are very good.